Have you lost all the settings? Um, okay, we, the, there's no real um, society business to, to bring up. Um, I'm being canvassed to talk about the 15-year um, plan that the Briars Management has released, uh, that, that the Shire has required it. Um, and that's basically to look at the developments of the Briars itself, and the Shires has a uh, quite extensive plan. It's something we've known about now for almost five years. The committee's been talking about it for at least three years, and the council have finally got around to releasing a, a discussion document. So one of the things that we are going to do is have to make a presentation to the um, Briars management and the Shire on our view of what we want. And that will take a we need an overall take a few years, I should think, <laughs> given the uh, shire. Um, yeah, the, uh, the only thing of, that I could think of, the only thing of real interest astronomically was that the media have been plugging this uh, picture of a black hole, um, which is orange, I might add. Uh, and uh, I don't know why they've gone orange, other than the Photoshop people have decided that that would be a nice colour for the start. The black hole is actually black, it's the halo that's orange. Yeah, but the, the, the whole thing is anyone who's done astrophotography yeah. knows that colour is irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because you make it whatever you want it to be. And uh, for years, photographers have been trying to duplicate um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope <coughs> pictures. But the Hubble Space Telescope pictures are the astrophotographers there trying to duplicate um, pictures off ground-based telescopes, mm. and so that you know it's become synonymous with with the uh, electronics. And the thing about the black hole picture, which is fascinating, uh, is that that is a radio telescope image. It's not mm. an optical no, image. That's right. yeah. And so what they've and it's been done at three millimeter. 1.3. 1. 1.3. Um, so it's a it's a millimeter range radio telescopes, and they've managed to then, through a lot of telescope, a lot of computing power, generate an image, um, and um, then that's been released to the public, and somebody's decided that an orange black hole would be, would be really good. <laughs> Yeah. So what was it in its original state before they coloured it up? Uh, uh, what a 1.3 millimetre is deep infrared, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very deep infrared. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, got, it's got no colour from a black and white or what? Or shades of. No, uh, from well, human, well, human, well, human well, beings. Well, 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 yeah, human beings. Radio image, but the, the yellow represents the brightest, the brightest intensity, and and the black represents no. It's like saying it's like saying what colour is. Um, 3 AR, you know, <laughs> it's a radio station, and um, so it's got no colour. But so really, the orange comes from the researchers, they just visualise it. They just sort of pick the yeah, colour off the whole So it really yeah. doesn't have anything to do with hydrogen gas colour? No, 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 it's an artificial colour. And, and anything that's not a visible, vis, vis, visible image is artificially coloured. Yeah, yeah. why did that stuff yeah. go black and white, you know, sort of grey yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Which is really what it is. Yeah. But the media, they like, yeah, yeah. They like the colour. Isn't it representing the only activity sort of thing? And black is zero and the bright colour is the other the end. Yeah, yeah, but what is the bright colour at the other end? You mean the the activity activity when, when the girl was looking at that image on the screen in that in the photo that yeah. went viral, it was orange. So I, I dare say it's their idea of the scientists. The, 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 the visualization the, somebody language. likes oranges, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, thing, the thing I like about it, of course, is you're not seeing the black hole. No. What you're seeing is the event horizon. Because the, the light's going around the black hole and it's clipping the event horizon. So you see an area with which is black and some radiation around it, which they coloured orange. What is the black mouth in the middle of it? And what is that? Uh, it's nothing. The that, that, uh, no, there's there's no light coming from that spot. <coughs> that's all. Sorry? It, it, that, that's 
Well, I'd say it's the black hole, but that's because there's no light coming from yeah. the black hole, so yeah. you just see it as a black spot. Mm -hmm. And there's a recent research, <coughs> I'm sorry to get on, but whilst we're talking about this, some recent research says that if light enters a black hole, and other matter, it actually does come out the other end. Yeah. Well, it's, hold, that, yeah. hold that thought because there's some recent research to say that. Well, I'd like, to know, I'd like to know what model they're using. Well, it's all theory, really. Just, uh, no, the, no, the, it's the other end is, is highly hypothetical. <laughs> Most of this is fantasy. Jesus is a dear man. <laughs> could be an ultimate universe, could be uh, yeah, uh, a yeah. But we, we, we can't really. Uh, if you've ever seen the film the Interstellar, <laughs> we know what's on there because uh, the animators made it. There, there was a paper that said that this uh, asteroid that came from outside of the solar system was very small. So there are lots of papers. <laughs> uh, when you get down to that sort of level, in the theoretical physics, mm -hmm. you're not talking about reality. Mm -hmm. right? it, you're really talking about mathematical models, and they don't know how to interpret those mathematical models. So, you know, you can say anything. You could say there's bloody goblins. They get paid for that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I wish I could get a job. Um, uh, what happens though is that the energy. Whatever falls in the black hole, the energy that falls in um, is absorbed by the black hole. So the the black hole itself gets a bit heavier. Um, whether anything gets out in, through well, the back Hawking, door Hawking, or something. Hawking radiation is basically the only way to get Well, it. Hawking radiation is was, was uh, but, but, but you've got to wait a long time to, for something to... Uh, yeah, but the actual Hawking radiation, Hawking radiation was disproved Sorry. about 20 years Sorry, ago. Um, it's sort of got still got a lot of it. It makes sense for Hawking radiation, but, but if quantum theory is correct, then Hawking radiation exists. Um, what, it, what it says is that particles can form if the energy density, the, the volume density, is high enough you can spontaneously produce. They pop out outside of this, I call them, that's how it leaves energy. That, that's, that's, yeah, that's the theory. Anyway, that's an area, that's a, 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 a conversation that is better handled on the front of the line and we can get, get more esoteric stuff. Hang on, no one can hear you. No one can hear you. He uh, made his name. Uh, even more, not before, but he made his name by winning the Star Mass uh, Prize, which is a global 
um, as to photography for us. They did that twice. Done it. Anybody's ever done it. I, still, I think they stopped after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was too good. Um, and uh, he's also had the massive photo of the month and a whole bunch of, uh, of awards. So he really knows his stuff. And tonight he's going to talk about um, the uh, uh, use of uh, time-lapse photography, uh, which he's been doing for many years. Uh, I'll leave it to Alex. Yeah. Just a question for to Alex. During the presentation, can you touch on the new cameras that we're selling now rather than doing the SLR? We can do it what, at the end. What they're like, what do you think of the yeah. CCD versus something else? Can you come to the SLR? Uh, uh, I did. Yeah. It's, if, you, yeah. if we have time for it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a big it's topic. A big topic man. Yeah. About CCD yeah. versus CMOS. But I'll, I'll, I'll your try to. Weave that thought into, into what I'll happened. stay away from it. I'm, I'm an old film. <laughs> it's coming back. Right. Uh, I think the rain has stopped, so I can probably just. Uh, just uh, can we uh, do the yeah. lights? Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And uh, it's always <laughs> nice to go back the memory lane to 2008 when my daughter, that's now 14, was. And she says, you know, she's the reason uh, we are still looking for those aliens. And in the meantime, I'll just take pictures because it's easier to swap them that way. But uh, today's talk is very informal, and I just thought I'd share. Let me know if you have trouble hearing because of the rain. Uh, but I thought I'd share the uh, the recent uh, engagement that I had with. Uh, CSIRO, and I'm very thankful uh, to them for that opportunity to photograph radio telescopes in New South Wales, uh, in parks in Narrabri and, uh, and in, uh, in Western Australia in the Shire of Murchison. So uh, it's just more of a show and tell than a PowerPoint presentation. There are no slides, but I've got plenty of images and videos to show. and. Uh, Let's uh, begin with uh, the telescopes in New South Wales. So you, as you know, Parkes Radio Telescope and uh, Australia Telescope Compact Array, they are not far from each other. It's about three hour drive uh, up north from uh, Parkes to get to, to Narrabri. And uh, let's begin with Parkes. So what CSIRO asked me was to uh, whether I'd be interested in going and taking images of those radio telescopes for them. Uh, that was kind of a silly question. Of course, they wanted to, and they paid me for it. Um, so I'll show you some of the images. So as you know, Parks Radio Telescope is uh, part of the big celebration this year for, for, for the moon landing anniversary, uh, for the 50th. and. Uh, one of the required or rather desired outcomes uh, was an image of the moon and the dish. And uh, so I was, let me go to this. That, that was the night before uh, the moon. So uh, the sun and the moon in July set sort of roughly in the same spot. So I was trying to line it up and visualize the uh, what, what the picture would look like because the angular size of the moon and the sun are very similar. Um, so that was that was just a, a, a line-up shot at that time. And uh, another one, a few that I quite like as they are is uh, this and uh, that. So that was, that was more of a testing than anything else. And then uh, these were the the images uh, with the moon setting. I had it perfectly lined up and then the dish moved, <laughs> uh, as you see here. But it's not a bad image after all. So I'll show you a time lapse from that, uh, from that event. Uh, and then we can continue. So that's this was done with Canon 6D camera and a Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens 
at around 500 millimeters focal length. So yeah, that kind of shot is only possible with a either crescent or full moon. So it's a time lapse running, I think uh, about one shot a second. And uh, go to images. As you know, Parkes telescope is 64 meters in diameter sitting on a uh, tower. So overall height, I think, is somewhere around 68, because it goes quite low when it's pointing to uh, at the horizon. Uh, it nearly, if I, was, if I stood under it, it would touch my head, uh, the, the bottom edge of the dish. Uh, but it's, it's a very tall structure, so uh, it's quite difficult to photograph with uh, normal camera lenses. So what you're looking at is a, a mosaic, a panorama, that I stitched uh, with three images taken vertically with the fisheye lens, but stitching it and then projecting it using stereographic projection allows uh, to keep the straight objects straight so they don't uh, lean one way or another if they're closer to the earth. So if you look at the trees and structures around, they, they, they're kept straight. And that was actually a test image that CSIRO ended up using in, uh, in, in some of their posters. You, as you see those lights there, the, the, usually that dish is quite illuminated. There are lights on top of the controls. Uh, visitor center bill, no, that's the uh, radio astronomer's quarters. And on top of there, and then that behind it is the visitor center. There are projector, projectors that project LED lights onto, on, onto the dish, so it's much more visible, but it makes it almost unusable for photography because if you expose it for any more than five seconds, it just blows out. But for the purpose of this exercise, the lights were turned off, but not all of them. On the first night, uh, some of the security floodlights on the uh, radio astronomers' quarters were not turned off and on, and on the visitor's center. So I did this as a test lining up for the next day, thinking that when those lights will be turned off, it will be a, a, a better image. However, without those lights, it was not nowhere near as effective. <laughs> with, with the light shining through those windows, creating that sort of nice looking circle uh, and on, on the foreground, on the grass, made it look like a uh, scene from one of those alien type movies, <laughs> Contact or like. So uh, they quite liked it, and I, I do like the composition of this, so I kept the test image and, and not the other one. Uh, all right. What's happening there? So let's start here. Yeah, so that's also a fish image with the lights turned off now as you can see and the, the the lights they're just from the computers that run inside that building there and these are solar powered uh security lights that were covered with rubbish bin liners uh, to reduce the intensity and a few panels going vertically with the milky way kind of streaming from uh, the focal point of the antenna that's early morning twilight with uh orion Pleiades and Aldebaran next to the dish, and that light cannot be turned off. That's a safety feature for, for the aircraft that come in uh, with Moon and Venus. And those you saw, yeah, that's a uh, Moon and Venus up there. And uh, these are with the Sun. That's another mosaic panorama where you project it in stereographic projection. So when you look at the Milky Way and it stretches more than 90 degrees on the sky, you look at it and it curves, and that's exactly what uh, you see in those, in those panoramas where Milky Way arches as a rainbow. So that's just projecting uh, more, well, nearly 180, about 160 degrees here onto a flat surface, uh, like a world map. And that was the image on the first night. 
uh, with all the lights on. And I had to hide all these lights with those trees. Uh, you can see a bit of fog in the valley there, but wasn't where the camera was. And light is somewhat dispersed here. So that was also a test shot that ended up being, being in the final cut. And uh, as I walked from the camera towards the dish, I saw that meteor with my Bible, with my eyes. It was rather spectacular. Mm -hmm. And even better feeling I had was that I knew the camera was pointing in the right direction. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, quite a bit of red air glow in that area, red and green. Mm -hmm. And that's another one that uh, that must be light from the parks, North Park's gold mine, because the village of Parks is that way. And that shot has some elevation to it. Uh, so there is a, an RFI control tower that measures radio frequency interference, which is about 15 to 15, 20 meters high. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that was a, a, an extremely unique opportunity to actually look at the dish from, from the height and set up a time lapse that I'll show you. It sort of almost looks as if it wasn't real. It's a kind of animation in a cartoon. But you can see how much dimmer everything is when the lights are turned off, most of them. So these solar lights are covered with rubbish bin bags, some interior lights remaining there, but nothing else. Uh, another one with a meteor, and you saw this one. So I'll, I'll go to videos. And I play that. I'll play this from the tower. And no, that's 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 the first night with the with the fog. Uh, in the valley, you can see how light becomes more intense there, and the Milky Way is setting. So that's shot with Canon 6D, uh, stock standard camera, and uh, about say 30 millimeter lens or 35 millimeter lens. 10 second exposures, ISO 3200. Yeah, really nice skies they've got there for the most part. And then uh, you get the early morning twilight and Mars uh, rising up there. And uh, before this one, that's a long time lapse I might cut in the middle, but you can see the sunset short from the tower. Then it goes into evening twilight. Uh, and into the night the stars appear and then moon and Venus setting a bit of cloud for interest which is always good especially when the moon's around so you can see those clouds better these are trucks going on New York Highway mm. What sort of interval have you got between shots? Uh, as short as possible. So this is shooting at uh, 15 seconds exposure and one second interval between them. I don't know why is it not full screen. Should be. Is that just a standard night of observing on that part, or are they moving it around a bit more for you? No, it was whatever the astronomers were doing. Okay. Uh, this was operated, uh, this is a multinational team of astronomers that operated that. They were astronomers from China doing some searches. So, uh, not much of, of interest in that way. And then, uh, after midnight, around now, the observation switched to very large baseline interferometer and they were observing with all the other telescopes across the globe so you'll see actually uh, changes the observing pattern. When the scopes jump around like that, what they're actually doing is measuring the 
um, uh, intensity of radiation from reference spots so that they yeah. can get a background. Yeah, so it's a technique called chopping where they go into a calibration source and then to this source they observe That's every, right. every, every now and again. Yep, so that's back to the LDA now, which is much more photogenic than the other position. With the LBI observations, they don't do the reference sources. Just they can correlate all of that out yeah. from, from the other data. So the Milky Way sets and Mars coming down. And we're slowly getting into uh, into the twilight and uh, into the daytime. Silly question, but you're up that tower all night. No, the camera was just there. It's got to Without me, you'll see the tower. That's it. That's the thing oh, there. Yeah. That's the secondary dish, and the tower was just just there. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately staying on that tower all night was out of question due to OHNS. Um, and I guess this would be, that's a short one, uh, looking east as the Milky Way and Mars rise. And yep, so then Milky Way goes out of the frame. And uh, I stopped the time lapse. If you looked, yeah, quite a few planes go from Sydney to Melbourne, I guess, across that path. Uh, but what's interesting, if you look here, you'll see another photographer who I didn't know was there coming in and out with a headlight <laughs> in the time lapse really slowly. Yep, so that's, that's Park's dish. Um, so let's go to the compact array. Uh, there was another sort of fun thing I did, looking at those 120 millimeter glass balls. So the dish is focused in, in the in the piece of glass, but the stars are defocused, and you can see Scorpius and mm. colors of the stars in it. It's for their Instagram account. Mm. Uh, for the CSIRO, and uh, all the images and time lapses shown here are copyright CSIRO. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do it. Um, so let's go to Telescope Compact Array, uh, which is not far from Narrabri, and uh, go to time lapse. Uh, so it's uh, six dishes. Uh, running as a configurable array. Uh, five dishes are on rails and one uh, is fixed. That's a really short time lapse. The reason I kept it is because of, if you look, uh, sorry, I'll just start again. If you look here carefully, you'll see the kangaroo <laughs> going slowly and munching on whatever grass is left. Is that what you call synchronized astronomy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that is the compact configuration of the array. Uh, so that's a north-south line, and it's east-west line. And three dishes are on the north-south line, and three are on the east-west as well, sort of in a, in a T-shape. And that's the most photogenic uh, configuration when they observe in, uh, in a millimeter range. Uh, they always use this compact configuration, and then when it goes into a uh, longer wavelength observations, they spread them out. So I think this can go about 600 meters and that can go more than a kilometer uh, on those rails. And it takes them about a day to reconfigure the array into, into a different configuration. So they run those on, uh, on rails, but very slowly. Um, so let's have a look at that, that time lapse looking east. So all, all of the dishes observed in unison, is, uh, they do synchronous observations. And all, all of the observations were for the very large baseline interferometer 
and that's why they wanted me to shoot at that period of time because any interference caused by my cameras will be cancelled out by other telescopes across the world. Let's see. Nice time lapse with Karina in Southern Cross. So the moon set that where the blue light came from. And if you look closely here, I think no, it's not in this time lapse, it's in a different one where the meteor came. Uh, through the whole cycle I'll show it to you now. So it went just through the call set, about there, yeah, you saw that, I've got an image of it as well. So that's, that's a 35 millimeter lens, uh, time lapse, which looking south just shows all the dishes plus the most interesting bits of the southern part of the Milky Way. So the telescope array, when I go to the images, and I'll probably do that now. Uh, is there anything else worth showing? Yes, there is. Uh, that time lapse I was planning for a long time and was hoping it would work out. So it's done with an 85 millimeter lens, five second exposures uh, without tracking, but you can see Lagoon and Eagle and uh, Swan Nebulae, Swan and Eagle, and all the goodness of the Milky Way as it sets just behind the dishes. So the sky is very transparent towards the horizon in Narrabrine and that's uh, something that I don't see very often uh, in time lapse, sort of a, an 85 millimeter close up of the core of the Milky Way with the foreground elements. And going to the images. here with the Magellanic cloud, large Magellanic cloud above the telescopes and very strong uh, yellow-green air well, so if you can see the edge of the air well. That's a same image, just a different version with uh, small Magellanic cloud above it, but then the dishes kind of disappear uh, in the frame. However, they do a lot of uh, observations of LMC and SMC and it was important to have an image if they publish a paper, if CSIO publishes a paper about uh, some sources in large or small Magellanic clouds, then this can accompany the, uh, the publications. So that's, that's the 85 millimeter image with the, the mo one of the most interesting, most beautiful sections of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Where's the lagoon, Triffid? Uh, which one's Eagle? This one and this one. And M M M M24 sat cloud. Uh, that's with the Milky Way diagonally. Present moon. I just liked the way this formation of the antennas looked from, from that angle. That's the meteor that you saw in the time lapse. You couldn't wish for a better placing. <laughs> uh, in the frame, it's a mosaic uh, with the gate of the visitor center and uh, the accommodation, but no one really stays there. It's all remote now. Uh, it, last time I was there in 2012, the place was a buzz with people. Now. Uh, it was just one person looking after the, looking after everything. There was no one else, <laughs> so they, they moved completely to remote. And uh, so that's the visitor center, and as you see, this fenced line that's where visitors can stay. Um, and you can stay sort of after the sunset, a few hours, if you want to. And from that angle, it's actually a reasonable view towards the telescope with with the Milky Way. 
so if you are in the area of Narogra, it's worth the visit just just to see how these dishes operate. They're about 24 meters in diameter, uh, so about 30 meters tall structures. And they have an open day, which I haven't been to, but uh, during the open day they take people inside those dishes and actually on the surface if you're lucky. Um, yeah, so uh, that's publicized by CSRO when when the, the, the open day occurs, it's once a year. Uh, so just different versions of cropping. Two kangaroos here. There are 2,000 roughly kangaroos resident on the territory of the observatory. That, that, was, that was in 2018. And uh, you, <coughs> I was really thinking, uh, will my tripod escape being bumped by a kangaroo or not? <laughs> to, to, to that point. So there. But as you, you try to photograph them, you come close to them and they, they, they just disappear. They don't like attention. Uh, so some more of the images. That's looking north. And uh, yeah, that's a different crop of the, of the meteor. That's a nice mosaic with the Milky Way arching above the array. It's the visitor center, so it's um, most of the images of radio telescopes that I shoot are uh, panoramas because it's rather difficult to keep everything straight and include a large portion of the sky. So if you point your uh, 14 millimeter lens towards the stars, everything that's in the corner, that and that will just point towards the center. So the way to overcome it is to shoot multiple images and then stitch them on a computer uh, in, into a panorama and project in a projection that keeps straight lines straight. Um, so a few more. Mars was really bright. Uh, it was, must have been June, July 2018. And uh, yeah, so you saw those. So that's uh, for the uh, Nara Bryan Parks, and now to the most interesting and most spectacular, from my point of view, trip that I made. I actually made two, one in August uh, 2018 and one in February this year, to Murchison in Western Australia, uh, where the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder is located. And the trip in August uh, was just at the beginning of the wildflower season, so uh, the uh, CSIRO site manager, Brett, said that when they were driving back from the telescope, there were no flowers on Friday, when we were going up on Monday, all of that had appeared. And uh, that's, uh, that's quite a, that, that shot on a, uh, on a phone, with a phone camera. It's quite a spectacular sight with those flowers. They, they look like snow going into the distance. But uh, these flowers are pollinated by flies, not bees, and uh, you can imagine the smell from those flowers as you get out of the car. I thought I stepped into something, but no. It was those beautiful flowers, but smell is not so. And the Sturt Desert Peak, uh, there were quite two or three bushes along the, along the path. It's that, that road to the radio telescope is uh, a popular tourist destination only for about three or four weeks when the wildflowers are in season and that's when you see sort of more than half a car as, as, as you drive up uh, so uh, again wor wor worth a visit going inland from from Geraldton <coughs> for those wildflowers uh, usually sort of around late August and uh, one of the shots that uh, I wanted to do in 2012, didn't get to do it, but what this time is to, to mount the camera at the focal point of the dish and just run the time lapse all night to see how, see the, the, the sky with the eye of the dish. So as you can see, it's a highly technical mounting method with lots of uh, electrical tape. <laughs> and a Gorilla Port tripod. Uh, so this is a calibration source that Black Kim, it's made from plastic 
and then we just mount it to those handles that, uh, the two handles that are attached to the cover. So that, that was great thrill to actually uh, go up on the uh, elevated platform onto the beach and take it up to the middle. Uh, they're reasonably safe to walk on those panels, and that's the phase array feed receiver, the know-how of CSIRO that uh, makes this telescope unique. So you see those squares there, there are 36 of them. So they're 36 pixels. Usually when radio telescopes observe, they observe with one pixel. And it's very narrow field of view. This type of arrangement allows the telescope to scan six degrees of the sky any single time. So it's, it's a great uh, survey instrument that allows them to scan the sky really quickly. And that was designed, developed by CSIRO. It has been unique until now. I think uh, the tele radio telescope in the Netherlands had their own phase array feed uh, that they commissioned this, this or last year. But uh, the dish itself is uh, 12 meters in diameter. They were made in China. Uh, and the idea was to uh, have dishes that are really inexpensive to make. So the dish was something like uh, $150,000 all up with all the drives and the structures. Uh, the receiver, the first version, was about a million dollars. Now they put it down to about 200000 uh, in, in production. But uh, the idea was to have a dish that is okay, not perfect, and compensate for all of the deficiencies of individual instruments in software uh, when they correlate the signal from 36 antennas. So there are 36 antennas like that, uh, spread across uh, three kilometers. I think the longest baseline is three kilometers from one telescope to the other. So that's the core of the array, uh, central six antennas, and that's uh, just a shot from the morning, uh, picking up the camera after the night of the time lapse there. There is the antenna number 19 with the camera attached to it. And that's, uh, I think if I play it, that will be the, the movie of me going up to mount. So I just have the phone to shoot what it looks like to go up on the structure. Quite a few flies as you would have noticed. And that's the elevated platform that <coughs> took me up on the antenna and I also used that as a uh, platform for the tripod for the, for the elevated shots. And that's uh, site manager for right here. So let's go to the night stuff. Let's look at the, uh, the view from the antenna first, because it's probably the most, most interesting. So the sun sets, the antenna is not tracking, it's fixed position on the sky. And the same thing now, it's, it's not moving. You can clearly see those pixels in the receiver. Antenna is looking nearly at zenith, so that's why the Milky Way is so defi well defined despite the uh, present moon there. But now we'll switch to a, no, that's still a fixed antenna uh, with large and small Magellanic clouds. It, and now the antenna is tracking the core, but it's not rotating. In this frame, the antenna is tracking and rotating, so you see the sky is fixed and the ground is moving. <laughs> so that's another unique feature of uh, square kilometer array bus finder, <coughs> CSIRO telescope, that it can track in three axes. So it can track an altitude, an azimuth, and then also rotate the antenna as the object moves through the sky. So it allows them to track objects for up to 10 hours, or eight, eight to 10 hours in the sky. Eight, realistically, because of the uh, altitude limits. Um, so let's look at uh, this one. <coughs> So that's the main core of the antenna. Milky Way setting shot with a 45 millimeter lens. And uh, the antennas were scripted to rotate at predefined intervals. 
the array was not observing, so uh, they were doing permissioning run, adding more antennas to the telescope. And uh, that's why we had the luxury of actually using the telescope to what we needed it to do, rather than, uh, as in Parks and Narrowbright, they were observing real science targets. Here I had the UHF radio and could say, please turn the telescope 10 degrees up and minus 20 degrees in azimuth. So that's, that's the morning. You saw that shot behind the camera, uh, shot from the phone. And uh, let's go to, the, to this one. So you notice as, as the sun sets, when the telescopes observe, there is, uh, the, when the receivers are on, there are actually three green LEDs that are bloody bright. And they compete with the moon for for lighting, so we had to turn the receivers off uh, on each of the antennas that were in the picture so that uh, they, they would not look like that. But one shot just showed how it looks like. Uh, there, that's the time lapse, quite the long one as well, from the Cherry Peak of the Moon is setting just there, and you can see large number of antennas in the array all doing the same thing. And what was remarkable, uh, when I walked with the Milky Way behind me, I could really see, it, at that point, I could really see long shadows from my body cast on the, on the red soil. And uh, you, know, you lift your arm and you see the shadow extend. It was the most remarkable feeling. And how transparent the sky is towards the horizon. When the Milky Way sets, it's parallel, it's flat, and it almost feels like you can walk into it. And now the uh, morning twilight, and you will see my extended tripod shadow here. Again, I wasn't in the cabin all night. Uh, so unfortunately, this facility is not open to public uh, for visits. It's, they, they had an open day as well, which was, I think, the first time they did it. Uh, in 2018, in October, where public was welcome to actually come and see the telescope, but not at night. I think they will be doing that uh, again, so if you plan a visit to Western Australia, it might be worthwhile coordinating with that time. And that's a similar shot with an 85mm lens towards the Milky Way, uh, with Griffith and Lagoon, and sort of slightly more south than the other one. I did it at Camp. Remarkably clean for that low elevation. Yeah, so being there and being able to direct the antenna. So I spent most nights from sunset until probably 2 o'clock in the morning to actually uh, work around the antennas. Uh, so that was. Uh, an experience of a life, lifetime, and I thought, you know, you shot the telescope, what else can you do? There are almost all of the radio telescopes in this country, except uh, the Heathcliff radio telescope that was recently commissioned. Uh, but then I had a call from uh, CSIRO again asking if I would be interested in doing something more, a bit more special for the diversity campaign that coincided with the uh, Sydney Mardi Gras Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, why is it not opening? So that was, yes. Mm -hmm. That was the image that I shot in February mm -hmm. with the uh, antennas colored in the rainbow bright colors. And uh, colors are made by Arlec work lights that CSIRO employees colored with Texas, the lenses. <laughs> and uh, these lights were a bit too bright for 15 or 30 second exposure at uh, ISO 3200. So we had to wrap them in my usual tool for these, for that purpose, rubber pin liner. That needed four layers. 
<laughs> to, to dampen the light to a level which was level of illumination which was acceptable, you could barely see that these antennas were actually lit up. But in a long exposure, it showed up all right. And uh, that's the Milky Way going from Scorpius to Orion, stretching you know, with the Southern Cross above. So Milky Way rainbow above, above the rainbow on the ground. I'm quite happy with, with the result it turned out. And that, that, that was great fun as well. And uh, in February, the number of kangaroos on the dirt road, so there is 40 kilometers stretched from the observatory uh, back to the accommodation, which is a kettle, ex-kettle station uh, called Bulati Station. They used to do uh, a lot of sheep farming in the older days, and I think they won a number of awards for, for best wool producer in the 60s. But then they overgrazed the territory and they could no longer sustain sheep. Then the wild dogs came in, so they, they do, uh, the neighboring cattle stations took uh, mainly bulls and cows. Uh, the Bulladi station is free from animals, supposedly. There are still a few lingering cows here and there. Uh, but it's 40, about 45 kilometers out of the uh, telescope, and uh, on one of the nights I decided to count how many kangaroos uh, we see just on the surface of the road, not those hiding in the bushes. 93. 93 kangaroos, so that's uh, like every 500 meters there was one. And they like to see the headlights, so they keep on going with you as long as you drive. <laughs> just one, one group was going for like probably five, five, five kilometers just in front of the car. And you couldn't move them sideways. They're big, they're not the eastern grey, they're big red things, quite scary, it's males especially. Lots of female kangaroos with joys. So amazing. Uh, uh, the time lapse is not much really to show, just a little bit with the moon set and the antennas moving. I like the washed out candy colors uh, by the moon. But one of the lights, uh, the battery discharged, unfortunately, the two LSO left to cut the time lapse short. But the main goal for this and, uh, was to, to, to shoot that image that you saw earlier. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that's it from me as far as images and uh, videos. Hope I managed to take you there a little bit. It doesn't convey the beauty as you see it uh, when, when, when you're there, but these images are at least something for me to, to hold on to. Remember. Southern Cross, mm -hmm. and then 85 for those really close up times. But yeah, that 14 is the main main lens that I would use go, go to almost every time. And then uh, 35. So I usually set up two or three cameras. One would be with 14 millimeters, another one with 35, and another one with 35. Uh, 14 is 2.4, 35 is uh, 1.4, and uh, 85 is 1.8. And full frame cameras. Yeah. 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 That's a difference. The, um, the, uh, um, the sign you, you go from um, wide angle and then go to panoramic. Mm -hmm. So you, so you basically take those with the raw images and then you put them into another into software, so, software yeah. and then the, and you just say, oh, well, panoramic of that. And you say it flattens it, flattens yeah. it out. So you, you shoot with overlap, 
uh, say 35% overlap, so the image, as, as you pan the camera around, you create, you know, I, I, I go for quite a lot of overlap, 30 is minimum, usually 35-45%, yeah. and then the software picks those stars in neighboring images and stitches them together, so it lines it up. And then you, you end, if you shoot the whole circle, you end up with a sphere, uh, which then you can project any part of on a flat surface. Have you ever used medium format, large format cameras? No, uh, they haven't been sensitive enough historically. They are now, yeah, they are, uh, yeah. but uh, usually they sort of picked out at ISO 800, yeah. and uh, they're big. The lenses are big, and the benefits are kind of marginal because the lenses are slower. Yeah. So you can get f 1.4 lens for. 35 millimeter yeah. camera, and then uh, an equivalent would be a 4 4. And it's always ISO 3 2. Yeah. Three, three, uh, three, usually, three. I just, yeah, I could literally disable all the controls and just leave the camera in one mode. Yeah. Manual focus, manual uh, exposure, ISO 3200, 15 or 30 seconds. Yeah, there are going to be issues. I know they probably have got a bigger range, but how do they compare a lot with a uh, can they see more uh, with with them big dishes than the the them uh, the telescopes with the computer? I know they've got a bigger range, but do they pick up more in the sky than uh, any other yeah. computer in the sky? Uh, so like the computer ones we have here. Or? So the idea is you because the wavelength in radio is longer than your optical, so you need larger surface area to mm -hmm. to collect an equivalent amount of of those photons or radio waves. Uh, so they can build telescopes like Parks, 64 meters, but that's about the limit. There is, the, for a steerable dish, the telescope in Tidbin Villa, where I'm going next, uh, this new one, to, uh, to do last topic that I haven't done for CSIRO. Uh, their dishes are 70 meters, so it's a bit bigger than Parks. Uh, then there are non-steerable dishes in China and in Arecibo. That are a receiver telescope is something like 120 meters. The, the one in China is even bigger, something like 200 meters in diameter. But it's a transit telescope. It doesn't, the, the dish stays fixed in the ground and the focal point moves somewhat to track the object, but it can't follow the object across the sky. So an alternative is to put multiple small dishes. Mm -hmm. And if you spread these dishes as in, say, three kilometers baseline, then your telescope effective aperture becomes these three kilometers through the uh, measuring of the uh, applying interferometry mathematical computations to the images <coughs> from both telescopes. So it's imagine like having a three kilometer dish, but with uh, sort of uh, only some areas of that the dish being up. So it's like a dirty large large, large lamp that's very dirty with the patches. Uh, of dirt in between those dishes. But that gives you a lot more resolution. It doesn't give you the light gathering power or radio wave gathering power, but because you have that spread, you can pinpoint the source in the sky a lot more accurately. Mm -hmm. And that's why they use those telescopes in conjunction with the telescopes in Europe, in North America. So that baseline is the whole globe of Earth. So, you know, so it's very, very large. And that's how they were able to do the the black hole, the Event Horizon Telescope, is a network of... Uh, could, they, could they pick a black hole up on one of them? Well, I don't know if they could do it with the uh, ASCAP because it's uh, for 21 centimeter redshifted wavelength, so therefore for a bit longer wavelength, but with compact array telescope, definitely. Uh, so with specialized instruments that observe in this millimeter wavelength, uh, they use the telescopes across the globe to increase the <coughs> yes, well, I asked Peter that tonight, if before you started, if uh, you can pick up black holes on telescopes. Yeah. That's what they did. Well, not the black hole itself, but the stuff around it. Mm. Yeah, okay. Actually, you can see that black hole visually. Well, not the black hole, but the relativistic jet coming of M87 with a powerful telescope, it, it's, it's observable to a naked eye through, through an eyepiece. Oh. I, coincidentally, on 10th of April, when this that was coming out, I was photographing M87 with my 22 inch. <laughs> Haven't looked at the images yet. I can remember giving a, a talk at Frankston High School uh, when we were the Frankston Astronomical Society about M87 and at that time 
black holes were still science fiction, right? And I can remember giving a, a lecture, pointing out the observational evidence that said there is a black hole in M87. Mm. Um, and the, the, um, the uh, beam from M87 that had just been discovered. Mm. Yeah, that relativistic jet is easy to photograph. And actually, I'm not sure how observable it is from our latitude, but from Northern Hemisphere. It just time. shows you how the technology has changed, mm -hmm. in that at that time it was absolutely at the extreme edge of, of what was possible. Mm -hmm. And now amateurs can do it. And now amateurs can go out with a commercial, you know, snapshot type camera and um, take pictures of it. Mm -hmm. um, Alex? Despite the fact some of the members abandoned us, go off to wherever the end of the world. Um, so we'll we'll run the barbecue, but I don't think too many people will be turning up. Um, now that I've got the cash box back, I can't afford to go on. Um, so uh, as far as business tonight, I think that probably things. Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a, something to show, but I don't know whether you haven't got anything set up to show it on. Or... Uh, what is it? A uh, card, is it? Oh, I've got it. Um, I can. So, if it's on a USB stick, we can repair it. Just pull it off.
The Melbourne Reservatory basically, uh, probably aware that we were around the market, yeah. doing a lot of work to get the, uh, the, the old, the, um, the Great Melbourne Telescope um, uh, restored. Uh, it's still a fair way off. So Ian will probably testify. Long <laughs> way. Um, but um, one thing, one thing that's concerning us, and, in, and, and certainly other people as well, is that the, well, since um, Jeff Kennedy, the, um, the, the, the observatory grounds have, have been under the management of the um, Botanic Gardens, and we're a bit concerned about how it's all happening going forward. And um, the, uh, the, the Melbourne City Council have sort of released their strategic plan for that area and the Botanic Garden has had a lot of input into it. And uh, as, as I think one part of this things talk, doesn't talk about the Melbourne Observatory, it talks about the observatory gate entrance to the Botanic Gardens. <laughs> um, so there's quite a lot of, there's still quite, still quite a bit of history left in that place there and we're concerned about actually trying to preserve it. And I think one of the problems is the Botanic Gardens use uh, um, uh, restoration and, and um, enhancement of, uh, of the observatory, like putting lots of lights in. <laughs> and um, certainly, I don't know how much you know much about the um, the, the Great Melbourne Telescope, but it, but in, in its era, uh, for about thirty years, it was the largest durable telescope in the world. Um, and it was only really the next the next class of telescope came along and and and, and overtook it. The uh, some of the big American ones. Um, in, the, in the early 1900s, but um, it was done at a time when, when um, typically um, telescope mirrors weren't weren't made of glass; they were made of speculum, which didn't, didn't work quite as well as the, uh, the, the, the later glass ones. But it certainly did do a lot of great work. And um, but unfortunately, I think the Victorian government didn't publish as much as much of the work they did as they could. It also wasn't designed for uh, for astrophotography as well, whereas the late or the next generation um, was predominantly uh, more for um, photography based, uh, you know, as the camera improved. Um, but the, um, there's, a, there's a group called the, uh, what is it called, the <coughs> Friends, of, Friends of Melbourne Domain Parkland uh, and the Friends of Melbourne Observatory. And they're, they're, they're sort of holding an open day on the, on the <coughs> side of the May. And it'd be a good idea if, if you're interested in having a look at, look at the site and just uh, like, like to sort of send a bit of a message to say that you're interested in, in keeping the Melbourne Observatory going and, and so forth to come along. Uh, it's a free event um, and uh, you know, have a look through some of the telescopes that are there. Uh, there's, there's certainly a couple of interesting telescopes in, on the site. Um, and there's uh, yeah, fellow, fellow, fellow good buildings. If you're looking at the um, Queen Cross. You can actually see a photograph of the Great Melbourne Telescope here, right on the right hand side. Um, and uh, got a few of the other domes in place there. Of course, there's a lot more trees there now than <laughs> I was taken. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll shoot that around on, um, on, on the interview uh, anyway, so I've uh, got a copy of that. But thanks for that. While you've got that there, what, what, yep. that swamp at the back, that is near Albert Park Lake. That's right, Albert Park Lake, yeah. It's called Albert Park Lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get this. You can see the bay there, the filter, I'm sure. Yeah, the background, yeah. In the, uh, you can't see it in that photo, but then you can see the ships. Yeah, I think that's from my photo. I think that's probably my risk. One of the things, one of the historic facts about the Great Military Telescope is that it was paid for by the gold rush at um, Ballarat. 
the, um, Melbourne made so much money out of it, out of gold, and so from a historic point of view, that's probably the, the remnants of uh, of the gold rush. Yeah, well, well, well a, lot, a lot of a lot of Melbourne's great buildings come from that era as well. Things yeah, like the right. town hall and the mm -hmm. apartment building, that are all mm. all from that, that, that era. And <laughs> it was pretty much said that we were Melbourne, and Melbourne had the money. Yeah. Yeah, I thought in absence of Greg, I won't be doing the Skype for the night, but uh, there is one important event coming up on April 25th, which is the occupation of Saturn by the Moon, and that's in the evening when the Moon will be rising, it will be almost, Saturn will almost go behind it, so I'll ju what I'll do is, I'll just go to the 25th and uh, play a simulation of it in Stellarium, in the east. So let's go to the eastern horizon. And I think from memory, so that's it. So that's for the Briars. Uh, <coughs> So the time is here. Uh, let me go into daytime window. So 22:30. Uh, if we lock on, I don't know why is it not working properly. Yeah, now we're talking. So we lock on the moon. Uh, pause the time and uh, the time of ingress is roughly 22:40. Uh, it will hide the 22.41, should disappear, and the altitude of the moon, though, is only 3 degrees at that time, so it's really, really low, any telescopic observations would be out of question. You could simply see the dot disappear if you're lucky if the horizon is clear. And the azimuth mm -hmm. is 114 degrees. So that's uh, nearly due east, uh, slightly sort of north from it. So it should be observable from here, because we've got quite clear views towards east northeast. Uh, and then it will reappear, I think, around an hour later. Let's just go back to the moon. Uh, so 45 minutes later, so the egress from Briars would be from the dark side of the moon around 23.25. So 20, 22.40 to 23.25. And the egress will be a bit better positioned at 11 degrees altitude. Still not brilliant, but a lot better than, mm. uh, than three. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's the only full occultation this year that is observable from Victoria. There will be more that can be seen from Western Australia. And there is another one coming a few months later, I think in October, but we will only see one part of it. We won't see it coming and out. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'm glad I remembered about this. So yeah, if, if, if the weather is anything different to what we have now, uh, we might be able to see it. So 25th, what is it? The Thursday, Easter Thursday, so to speak. <laughs> Right, so thank you very much, and um, we'll see some of you on Saturday.